So the first one is what's called a convolutional neural network. And again, with this one, I will start at a very high level, abstracting out a lot of the underlying details, but then we'll get pretty specific here. So uh, convolutional neural networks are very good for imaging and vision problems. Um, so in this very high level example expressed here, we want to do facial recognition. So I have a couple million images of people's faces, and I'm going to train on those through this network. And then I'll pump in someone else's, a, a new person's face, and I'll attempt to do a prediction. Okay, at a very super high level right now, sort of general principles of this, okay? Now the first layer of a convolutional neural network is the input layer. That, in this case, we're inputting the raw pixels of the image. And the first layer of a convolution is where we break that image down into pixels. And we use what's called a patch or a receptive field, and I'll show you this in code how we define that, to establish uh, how much of that image we're going to pull out, how many pixels, what is the depth, and how we're going to move that in a window-like fashion across the image. Moving that window across the image and collecting those pixels is called a stride. And we'll have various layers of activation, various layers of convolution, where we'll start to build the image back up, where ultimately at the end, in what we call a fully connected layer at the output, is where we'll do a scoring. We'll make a prediction about who it is we're looking at in terms of this, uh, this image, okay? Now this is very good for autonomous driving. If we have a camera uh, at the front of a car and we're doing autonomous driving, it's probably pretty good to recognize you know, that that's a stop sign versus a yield sign, for example. Those sort of use cases uh, are sort of low-hanging fruit, if you will. So then, they are multi-layered networks for solving computer vision tasks. The purpose of a convolution is to extract features from the input image. We're going to set small squares up as inputs, either as a, we call them a patch or receptive field. We'll define that in software. And then when we move that across the image in a window fashion, that's called a stride. And the typical layers of a convolutional neural network, we always have an input layer. In this case, we're inputting the raw pixels. The convolution layer computes the output of neurons connected to the local input regions, computing a dot product between the weights and a small region of the connected input volume. And then you'll see activation functions that we referred to earlier. Um, a variety of those activation functions and then a pooling layer does a downsampling. And then again, the fully connected layer is always at the end. Okay, so um, what does that actually, how does it look like in a real network? So here's an example that I've worked up. So here's a convolutional neural network for detecting brain anomalies from MRI images. So the idea here is that I have a couple hundred thousand MRI images of the brain. I have images that represent a variety of conditions. Uh, everything from Lyme disease to Alzheimer's to a tumor in the brain. Um, I also have images of completely healthy brains as well. And I'm gonna go about training a convolutional neural network here using the layers that I describe here. We have various layers of convolution where we're pulling that image apart. And then we have rectified linear unit there as an activation function. And then another convolution layer, another activation, and then a pooling layer does a downsampling. Now we could have many, many layers like this, depending on what it is you're trying to achieve. And ultimately at the end is the fully connected layer where we're doing some prediction. Now I am using as the basis for this architecture, the TensorFlow inception architecture, okay, as a starting point. So we do that training and we get good predictive results. Um, and now we'll put that into practice. So we have a 55 year old male with vision problems, headache and numbness. Um, and we suspect based on uh, those symptoms that he may have a tumor in the brain. So we do an MRI image 
And again, we run it through this convolutional network, breaking the image down into discrete pixels in a patch. And over successive layers, we're going to make a prediction. And at the end, very fortunate for him, there are no issues uh, that we found. Okay, so that is a very sort of high level example of how you would use a convolution network for medical imaging. Now, I've introduced a lot of abstract concepts of optimization, backprop, uh, activation, uh, various layers I've expressed here. How do you actually go about implementing that? What I've done is just provided uh, for you, and you can refer to this in more, uh, you know, you've got more time later to refer to this. This is some Python code that I've uh, put together here. It is not a complete example, but just to show you how you would express that, those abstract concepts in code. So we're calling a NumPy library. This is a, using Google's TensorFlow tool. Um, now what I'm doing is I'm going to start building up convolutional layers. So you can see it's different than deterministic programming. I'm establishing the architecture of the network. What do the layers look like? Here I'm assigning a pixel patch size. I'm making a determination about what activation function I'm going to use for the first layer. And now we're building up the second layer. And I haven't included all the code here for all the layers, but just to give you an example of what it looks like uh, here. Uh, various other functions. And then here is where we're loading in uh, the brain images. And then we're starting to train the model. Okay. There's a lot more code, obviously, that goes into this, but I just want to show you that. Sometimes when I get into showing, you know, abstract concepts, it's hard to translate that into what you might actually implement in the real world, okay? Now, the next, next example is the evaluation of 12-lead electrocardiogram image segments by convolutional neural network. So you're, I'm sure, familiar with a 12-lead electrocardiogram. Um, that's those strips. Um, these are patches that are put on patients. You measure the electrical signals from the heart. And based on the measurement of those signals, they're represented as waveforms on a strip. Um, and the idea here is that I want to do training on the segments of the waveforms represented on those strips, both for patients that are completely healthy with a normal sinus rhythm as well as patients that express abnormal waveforms and those segments. Now, as you can imagine with this problem, there's a lot of pre-processing involved in terms of breaking the segments apart uh, to get them ready for training, okay? 12 lead is the gold standard that you'll find in a hospital. Uh, many of the consumer-oriented uh, devices are one lead, okay? So this is really the, the gold standard. Now, in years past, the way you would approach something like this if you want to do some machine learning, you probably would use uh, one of the supervised learning techniques we talked about earlier. Um, and you would look at the scalar values being expressed by the electrical signals um, and taking those numbers and doing some machine learning on those values. This is a different approach in that I'm actually going to use the waveform images and use a convolutional neural network as a classifier, okay? So we do training on several thousand of these healthy waveforms, those with various abnormalities. And now we have a 41-year-old patient that presents the emergency room with uh, intermittent chest pain. And we do a 12-lead ECG, and we run it through our trained convolutional neural network. And you can see that we're breaking the image down in a very discrete fashion in a patch and, and, and then moving those uh, image segments up in terms of scaling, we're ultimately at the end, we're going to make a prediction. And in green is what the outputted prediction is. Now any cardiologist would look at that output and tell you there are some problems there. And what we do with this patient is we take him to the cath lab and find that he does indeed have a clogged artery and we unclog the artery and put a stent in, okay? Now the same inception architecture that I just used for the two previous examples has been used uh, by this group at Stanford, for example. 
Uh, same style of network, only in dermatology. So we have skin lesions we're training on, and we make a prediction at the fully connected layer of whether we believe that a skin lesion is a malignant or benign, for example. Here's good work, similar network actually, um, by the team at Google. So uh, diabetic retinopathy. We have images of the eye, both healthy images as well as eyes that represent some form of diabetic retinopathy. And we go through that same process of convolution and activation and pooling where ultimately then we can predict whether a patient has diabetic retinopathy or just has a healthy eye. And good work, similar network, actually the same network, the inception network, out of Germany here, um, images of the mouth and detecting whether there's incidence of oral cancer. Now in those examples, we all relied upon a common architecture. And that is an example of transfer learning. And the idea behind transfer learning is that, let's say we have a very good football player who's good at blocking and tackling and, and passing. Chances are his skills can be transferred quite readily into the game of rugby, right? The, this is the same sort of example where the inception model that was developed at Google is, uh, was uh, initially trained on images in the wild. And we've applied that with good results in medicine. Now, hopefully we're going to see more of those opportunities because the development of a convolutional neural network like, like the inception model is non-trivial. And it's painstaking uh, work by many people on a team, and I think many corporations don't have those resources today. So if you can leverage transfer learning opportunities, that might give you a leg up. All right.